This week on WDD's Hotspot. Imagine a world where humidity did more than just puff up your hair. A team at Columbia University used microscopic moisture sucking spores to power a small 0.1 kilogram car. Obviously, the concept is still in its early stage, but the success of the study means that evaporation could one day be used as a viable fuel source for gadgets that don't require a lot of power. The spores used to power the car came from the same bacteria found in dirt and human intestines, and swell or shrink depending on how much moisture is in the air. Each spore typically swells and then shrinks up to 6%, moved from dry air to extremely humid air, and then back again. The researchers harnessed that size-changing action by gluing thin layers of spores onto one side of curved sheets of polymer. When the spores swelled, that side of the polymer sheet lengthened, which in turn caused the curved sheet to straighten out. The stretching and contracting of these spore-coated polymer sheets were what caused the wheel to turn and the car to move. Mini is demonstrating a new technology, the light and charge system. The tech is making it possible for drivers to charge their electric vehicle from streetlights, in addition to providing efficient LED lighting. Integrating the charging points into streetlights would make it possible to actually build a charging network into the existing urban landscape rather than only at existing fuel stations. Because streetlights are already connected to mains electricity, the charge points will require little to no additional infrastructure changes. Not only would this substantially increase the number of public charging stations, it has the potential to provide more charging points than there are fuel pumps currently available. The light and charge points could be set up at any location where there is a streetlight and where parking is available. The units have a modular LED design and are more energy efficient than conventional street lighting. To use the charge points, drivers would need to connect their vehicle to a standard connector on the streetlight using a standard charging cable. A control panel on the light allows users to operate with the charging unit with the swipe of a card regardless of vehicle model. These days, 3D printing can just about do it all, from building human organs to wearable clothing. Now, a company called MX3D will be using robots to 3D print a steel bridge across the Amsterdam Canal. Typically, 3D printing metal materials is done inside machines that lay down powdered metal and then zap it with lasers, one layer at a time. What makes MX3D's technology so special, however, is that it's able to print with metals in mid-air. The bridge's robots will print their own supportive railing as they move over the water and construct the pathway at the same time. Construction is set to begin sometime in 2017, and once the project is finished, people will be able to walk across the first ever 3D printed arch. Qualcomm is making a big push towards promoting diversity in tech and the STEM fields. The wireless technology company based in San Diego built Think-A-Bit Labs, a mini school within their headquarters that was launched last year and includes beanbag chairs, whiteboards, and props of all sorts. Three days a week, busloads of middle schoolers take a field trip to the Think-A-Bit Labs, where Qualcomm staffers teach them about all the different careers the industry has to offer, and the students even get to build a robot at the end. Unlike other tech boot camps who cycle through a few dozen students a year, Thinkabit has brought more than 3,000 students through their lab. So what's included? In the morning, the team teaches students about all the jobs that exist at Qualcomm and similar tech companies, from librarian to systems engineer. They do a quick outline of the skills that go into each position, the average salary, the educational requirements, and how in demand that job will be by the year 2020. At the end of the day, students get a rudimentary lesson in robotics, fused with arts and crafts and some simple coding and electrical engineering engineering skills, by the end of the lesson, the students have created their own moving robot from scratch. In addition to training the students, Thinkabit has also begun hosting teacher training courses and counseling schools on how to build their own labs and design curricula. And due to such high demand for the program, they're thinking about expanding Thinkabit to four or five days a week. That's all for this week's video. Be sure to check in on Facebook and Twitter and catch past episodes on wirelessdesignmag.com. For the WDD channel, I'm Janine Mooney. Thanks for watching. Done. I don't breathe.